Royal Society of Edinburgh Rooms and to the BP Hutton Prize Lecture. The prize itself is a very prestigious and important <coughs> prize. It carries actually a pri the prize money of £10,000, which I'm very imp I didn't realise that until um, this occasion, and I think it's a significant um, point to make about the, the, this evening. Um, it's made on a biennial basis to early career researchers based in Scotland who have shown a significant individual contribution to energy innovation. So the, the title you will see uh, clearly fits all this. The prize is named in honor of James Hutton, the founder of modern geology through his book, Theory of the Earth, published in 1785. So the recipient this year is Lee Cronin, Regis Professor of Chemistry in the University of Glasgow. And he's made a wide range of research, um, including three-dimensional printing, robotics, and artificial intelligence. He's also keenly interested in understanding and controlling self-assembly and self-organization, which of course is at the root of life, the origin of life, both here on Earth and elsewhere in the universe. So, very broad interest. But today, he's going to tell us about um, his work on renewable energy resources, remo removing the fossil from the fuel. Lee. So, thank you very much for the <coughs> kind introduction, Professor Donovan. It's great to be here. Um, to give this lecture, a little bit nerve-wracking because we have to remove the fossil from the fuel in just 55 minutes. <laughs> and what I'm going to try and do in that, in that 50 minutes or so is kind of paint a picture of not about just about the research we're doing. In fact, I've resisted to go into gratuitous research that I would find extraordinarily interesting and you would find extraordinarily boring and try and place the problem in some kind of context and then actually talk about how fundamental science and innovation go together. And I think this is something I personally want to educate our wonderful politicians in that fundamental science is probably the key word, the key phrase, apologies. But once we're doing that, we shouldn't just abandon the technological outcomes. And I think that that's a very important thing that I want to say. And so, in really thinking about today's current catastrophe that we are facing or the current status of life on Earth, we are really interested in working out how humanity can proceed past this century. Martin uh, Rees said that basically he fears that humanity will be extinguished this century simply because we will nuke ourselves or we will change the climate to such a degree that it will make life for our children rather than us. And that's an important thing I want to have in our minds as well, that will make life for our children impossible. That's a pretty terrifying outcome. But I don't think it's all doom and gloom, and hopefully today we can not only discuss some of those, I can present you some ideas and we can discuss what that may mean, mean on, a, on a global context. So first of all, what is fossil fuel? And I think we all pretty much have a good understanding of fossil fuel. It's simply old life forms which have decomposed over millions of years, it produces a very high density material, coal, uh, petroleum that you can get from crude oil that you get out of the ground, gas, but it's dense because it has carbon and hydrogen. It's essential for humanity, despite all the talk of renewable energy, 80% of all the energy that we use is fossil fuel in origin. And what is even more terrifying is 50% of all the food that we eat is fossil fuel in origin. So suddenly, <laughs> it's okay, I can do it, I can, I can write on the board. Uh, if we are going to stop consuming fossil fuel, which 50% of the population do you want to starve to death? If we're going to stop consuming fossil fuel, which 50% of the population are you going to deny pharmaceuticals? So there's, a, but there's a, a terribly big problem. But we also have a, another problem I want to talk about. Now, I, was to, I gave actually, because my research group, I have a good number of people that I try, to, I try to preach by doing. 
So I make my group, whenever they give a presentation somewhere, give a run-through. So I gave a run-through on this this morning, which they ripped me to part, to shreds. And, and because we were trying to discuss about climate change, and I'll come to that in a moment. But the consequence of burning all this fossil carbon is, of course, that carbon dioxide um, concentration in the atmosphere is going up. Now, if that graph doesn't convince you with that insert here, going from 1,000 AD to 2,000, you've got something there. But I like this graph better. Between 1990 and 2015, the projection was, this was made, the data points at that time were made up to here, so roughly 2008. And the prediction was, in 2015, we would hit a magic watershed of around 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And we are there. We are bang there. This is a problem. This is a problem because we are disturbing our atmosphere in a way that, that hasn't been done before. Now, we can discuss, and we will discuss, what that means in the long run later. Where is the fossil fuel located? Well, it's everywhere. In fact, under Gatwick right now, there's about, I think, a trillion barrels of oil. So I think Gatwick can probably stop buying uh, um, kerosene for a good number of years and outbid Heathrow. But there is a lot of oil to be found. Now, when we talk about fossil fuel, one thing that we don't talk about is fossil oxygen. 20% of the atmosphere is oxygen. And there is more turnover for various reasons. But if we were to find all the fossil fuel, we would have no oxygen left. So I hope we don't burn it all. We're going to have a bit of a problem. Because for every carbon-hydrogen bond fix, there is some oxygen produced, fractions of oxygen, admittedly. So we want to think about that fossil oxygen as well. But anyway, fossil fuel is spread everywhere. And with the thawing, with the global temperatures increasing, of course, Russia and normally the quite accommodating Canadians want to exploit it. In Canada, the government will refuse to acknowledge that climate change is a problem. Also in Australia. This is a really interesting fact that we have to deal with geopolitically. But luckily, I'm not a politician. I wouldn't get a polit political job. <laughs> So how much have we used? Well, I was doing, writing this, this talk over the weekend and, and trying to get numbers, and this is great. I just want to know how much fuel had been used in the last 100 years. And The Guardian has this wonderful app that you can go to. where so I just want to know 100 years, so I'm not 100 years old. Um, the world has extracted and burned 1.6 trillion barrels of oil. That's quite a lot. Fair amount of coal. 131, if I can read that properly, trillion cubic meters of gas. That's a lot. And in just 18 years, or roundabout, if you're right, we will have basically exceeded the carbon budget to keep our global, average global temperatures below two degrees, uh, sorry, without going up by two degrees. And this two degrees is a pretty magic number because this is when uncharted territory, where we just don't understand what the models tell us. And I'm going to talk a lot about what we know and what we don't know. And as a scientist, I am really happy to tell you, science is obviously about what we don't know. It's about managing our, our, our Donald Rumsfeldness. Okay? It's not about giving you the answer. I don't know for certain if suddenly the world is going to end, if it goes up by three degrees. All I can tell you is that the temperature is rising. And that's an interesting problem. Why are we addicted to fossil fuel? Now, I apologize because there's going to be loads of graphs. No, I'm just joking or not. The reason is this. If I was to take a bit of oil, this volume, this volume of oil has the same energy content as this battery. I scaled it last night. So this is why when you buy your Tesla car, and I was hoping the prize would be a bit more money because then I would buy my own S-type Tesla, um, you will have range anxiety. Does anyone have an electric car here who's willing to... Brilliant. Do you have range anxiety, Colin? I, but you had that before you bought the car, didn't you? <laughs> I'll pay you later. Uh, but isn't it, isn't it interesting that, that, I mean, I bought my last ever fossil fuel car, and it's wonderful. And I worked out that probably I will not burn enough fossil fuel to make a big impact. But the, this is the big problem we're facing in terms of electrification. The world energy consumption is about 17 terawatts at the moment, 
And again, 80% is fossil fuel, petroleum, coal, natural gas, and renewables are just here, this green wedge. And we have this interesting juxtaposition in Scotland where we are the windiest, and we're gonna, we've got the fossil, we've got the gold off the North Sea. So uh, politically, I don't really understand where we sit. We are going to burn the stuff, and we're going to harvest the um, wind as well. It would be good if I could figure out politically in what direction we're going. And I'm not trying to make a snarky comment. I really mean this. I'm paying the politicians. You are paying the politicians to actually think about these problems on advice that organizations like the Royal Society of Edinburgh whose job is to provide impartial scientific evidence and advice to the politicians. Act they must. This is within 2013. We're going to get a, bit, a little bit less serious in a minute. So the energy mix is complicated. This is a graph that I took from a, a paper a few weeks ago that shows how all the different energy avenues, solar, nuclear, and if in particular, take natural gas, get, get, gets truncated into energy uh, electricity generation, residential uh, use, commercial use, industrial use, it's complicated. You can't simply wake up one morning and change everyone's energy supply. It just isn't going to happen. So the problem is complex. But let's think about the prospects for more fossil fuel. Because after all, it has taken us 600 million years to produce the stuff. So one of the interesting things about thinking about timescales, even if you're not a climate change believer, and you shouldn't be, I don't believe in anything, I just like evidence, or a climate change denier, one thing is for sure, the wonderful black gold is going to run out. Or the accessible stuff. We don't want it, the non-accessible stuff to run out because we won't be able to breathe. So, all the fossil fuels we're using right now produced over 600 million years. Here's the Heliocene. All fossil fuels will be burnt here in 300 years. So, I've come up with a grand plan. If we basically burn all fossil fuels for a year, and then we wait for about 3 million years, we'll replenish all the fossil fuel we burnt in the previous year. So let's do that. So what we'll do, no guilt, no climate change, excellent. We can burn fuel for a year, go silly, get on that plane, get in that car, just go, go, go for it and then wait for three million years. And when you put it like that, then you go, oh, gee, there is a problem, because we are going to use this reserve that we have available, and whether the climate is broken or not, our civilization will cease to exist when we can't extract it, or we have no further reserves. Now, this is the thing I like. I love this, actually, because this is a way of getting around the, um, the entire problem. Is fossil fuel causing warming? Well, I'm going to take an article from a news organization called The Onion. Some of you may have heard of it, just don't give it away, where they put in 2011 out a big press release saying, scientists trace heat wave to massive star at center of solar system. Here's a press release. This is a picture from the press release. Isn't it brilliant? This guy's like, look at the sun at the back. He's going, yeah, you know, we've got it. Groundbreaking new findings announced Monday suggest the record-setting heat wave plaguing much of the United States may be due to radiation emitted from an enormous star located in the center of the solar system. Scientists believe the star, which they have named G2V65, may in fact be the same bright yellow orb seen arcing over the sky day after day, and given its extreme heat and proximity to Earth, it is likely not to only have caused the heat wave, but be responsible for every warm day in human history. But there's more. Our measurements indicate the massive amount of energy, energy this thing gives off is able to travel 93 million miles and reach our planet in as little as eight and a bit minutes. While you can't see them, we are fairly certain these infrared rays strike the Earth's surface, becoming trapped by the atmosphere, and just heat everything up like a great big oven. <laughs> of course, this is satire. It's wonderful satire. And some people on Facebook picked up on it, thinking it was true. And it went around the web for a few weeks. And I think that one of the wonderful things about humanity is the ability for us to make fun of ourselves. So, of course, global warming is in fact caused by the fact we have a heat source, a light source, an energy source at the center of our solar system. That's clear. But what we have to really think about is the evidence that's causing the, the warming right now by CO2. Now, if you are in any doubt, go to this skeptical science 
Com, Argument PHP. There are a few here. Climate change before, yes, but climate reacts to whatever forces the change, and humans are now the <coughs> dominant forcing. It's the sun, is one. In the far past 35 years of global warming, the sun and climate have been going in opposite directions, cooling and heating. That's interesting. So you can go and have all these, these pieces of evidence, and in the end, you have to either conclude that the evidence points to warming, or you just don't like the evidence. And that's up to you. You know, that's, my job as a scientist is to present you with that evidence and my interpretation of it. If you don't like it, it's fine. We can go to the cinema and watch some fiction. Then, last year, Glasgow became the first university in Europe to divest from fossil fuels. Oh, sorry. Actually, this is a, I feel sorry because it was misreported because it was actually trying to do a good thing. And Glasgow is indeed the first university in Europe intending in t that to intend to divest, well, in that intends to divest from fossil fuels or discuss it, if you can read that. That's interesting. So we haven't done it yet, but we might. And we're actively having the conversation. I'm not making fun. It's a really good thing. This is really hard. Fossil fuel investments generate revenue. And having this discussion is something we have to do. And I think Glasgow have been really brave to have, start to have that discussion because it's going to hit their bottom line. And if more people do that, like the Gates Foundation, Microsoft, and all these big companies, maybe we'll start to figure out how we can move beyond the current um, situation. But there is hope if we shoot for the sun. There is this big ball calling global warming at the center of our solar system that happens to be doing a lot more than just heating the planet. It's providing us with an abundant supply of energy that we can harness. The problem is, how do we do this? We could use this solar concentrator. We can plant more trees. We can try and plant, get, grow more food. We can extract the heat energy from the atmosphere. This is our best chance in Scotland, although the last few days is getting me excited that we may have a spring. And there is obviously photovoltaics, which are becoming very exciting, solar thermal. And this is a big problem. And this is biofuels, because if we want to replace all the, the, the fuel, um, all the fossil fuel on planet Earth by biofuels, we'd have to outplant um, so much that half the population would again starve. So you're talking about in excess of 30% of the available land area of planet Earth would have to be dedicated to just driving our cars and flying our planes. And even if we could cultivate that, I'm not sure that that is an acceptable outcome. 30% is a lot. Um, we would starve. So what are the problems and needs? Well, if you think about solar energy just from a collection point of view, it's not that bad. Remember, humanity uses 17 terawatts. Just by having these little bitty areas here decked with solar cells would supply 20 terawatts. But we have a lot of land, but we can't store it. And we need dense fuels for transportation, food production. And we need chemical feedstocks for technology, drug production. So electricity doesn't do it all. So how do we get beyond this? We are in this perfect quandary where we are addicted to this fuel that's giving us economic progression. It's potentially harming our climate. And we only have a finite amount of it. And it would require us, remember, three million years for one year. And that for me, as a chemist, getting the kinetics right, thinking about my investment versus the return, is really interesting. So where does photosynthesis happen on planet Earth? Well, I'm sure most of it actually happens in the sea with phytoplankton and algae. And these little molecular machines basically take CO2 from the atmosphere. This is them in bloom. And you can see in the Atlantic right across the ocean. It makes a global impact. And it's fascinating to watch that most of the uh, oxygen produced on planet Earth comes from the sea. The lungs of the Earth are not the Amazon, although it makes good for Greenpeace to tell you and see a poor tree cut down, it's the, it's the sea. And that's fine, but we are acidifying the sea, and we're still within um, um, limits, but it is a danger. Because if we, if we kill photosynthesis in the sea, um, we're dead. There's no discussion. And we're dead relatively quickly. So how does photosynthesis work? Well, it takes carbon dioxide water and makes sugars. And it does this and produces oxygen. And what, the way this works is that we take light, different wavelengths of light with different energies, and we capture the colors. And the leaf, the green leaf, captures the different colors of light 
mainly blue, some red, and some yellow, and it does light reactions and dark reactions. The light reactions occur in the falcaloid, and the dark reactions occur in the stroma. And what happens is that the light pushes these electrons and charges up the batteries and pushes the electrons to make a kind of organic battery and activate them so you can move them around and start to do chemistry. And there are two photosystems, photosystem one and two, and then they actually got numbered in the wrong order, thanks to biologists. Oxygen is produced as a, as a byproduct from water splitting, and we can produce um, fixed carbon. So this molecular machine here does a number of things. It does light reactions with the photons. It then stores up those electrons to do dark reactions to produce sugar. And it does it wonderfully. And it does it on a planetary scale and is deployed and works. For, it's worked for the last three billion years or thereabouts, two billion years if you want to argue. So this then brings us to one conclusion that perhaps if we want to start to have a stepping stone to a new energy economy, we should maybe think about going for some kind of solar fuel where we can try and convert sunlight into a fuel. Why would we do that? Well, I want to fly. And I don't want to fly on a battery. I want chemicals because I want to carry on making drugs. I want to eat. And I, but I want to also remove CO2. Isn't it great? If I can come up with a system that can remove the CO2 and give access to fuel, chemicals, and food, we're happy. And the reason for this is we do not have to overtech. Because if everything is electric, how long do you think it's going to be before we get an electric combine harvester in, I don't know, deepest wherever, out of Mongolia? Or in, 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 in uh, China, where they're only just getting mechanized? So we need to think about how we can give people access to fuel without the guilt, because China needs access to fuel so it can increase uh, um, its prosperity and continue to bring the farmers out of poverty. And because th th most farming in the, in, in the uh, west of China at the moment is done by hand. There are a number of strategies. In Scotland, I like to think about going via electricity because sunlight is in short supply and I can use wind. And that's the first big comment I want to make, is that one of the interesting things, why this got started, is we thought about how could we convert solar wind in Scotland into fuel. So we have to go via electricity, and there are two possible, possible routes. There's this third way that can give us electricity, but we can use a, what's called a semiconductor junction, and we can make a kind of leaf. And I'll try and explain some of these strategies in the next few minutes. But what do we really need to do? What is the problem? What is the chemical problem? I'm going to get some chemistry in here. We need to capture and convert CO2 into fuel. We need a simple energy vector that can store solar, sunlight, wind, wave. And water is the answer, at least at this step, at this stage in the game, water. Because if you think about it, if we can give, make this universal energy currency available to people, and then they burn it, what are they going to get back? they're going to get back water. So that would be quite good if they're thirsty or they're in a part of the world where there is a drought stress and there's going to be quite a few coming. And so what we need to do is some kind of inorganic photosynthesis where we activate water and carbon dioxide. And for most of this lecture, I'm going to talk about what we've been doing in the lab to sort out water. And the big problem with all of this, and you can see these rotating here, these are actually real molecular models which will crash my computer. This is CO2, it's just a linear molecule. And this is water, a couple of hydrogens there. And the problem we have with CO2 is we need to get rid of those oxygens and put some hydrogens on there. The activation requires energetic electrons, it requires precious metals, and it requires lots of concentrated energy. This, this is the issue that we have. So why water splitting? Well, we can, get, we can do combustion for transport. We can do the Haber-Bosch process. That's really interesting because right now, to fertilize the planet, we have to take fossil fuel, coal, and crack it to get the hydrogen out. That hydrogen we then turn, use to take nitrogen to make ammonia. And that ammonia is used to fertilize the planet. So we're using fossil fuel to fertilize the planet to grow food. And this is one of the big problems that we're not discussing. That most, even if we stopped flying and driving tomorrow, we can't stop eating. 
I've tried, but it only works for so long. So we really need to sort this out. And also, with hydrogen, we might be able to think about carbon capture. Use that hydrogen to capture carbon. And also, we can do a traditional fuel cell and use the hydrogen to make a fuel cell and provide electricity. So how, what, how does water splitting work? This is a conventional process up here. Nice 9-volt battery with a couple of uh, tacks um, in some water. And there'll be a test. Which side is the oxygen and which side is the hydrogen? I'm, what, I'm serious. Not, no chemists. Well, there's two H2 there and one O2. There you go. There's your first chemistry stoichiometry lesson. And, and one of my students, the postdoc, said, oh, yeah, we know the hydrogen because it has these little wispy bubbles. And uh, yeah, he's right, actually. Yeah. Now, how do you split water? Well, actually, you're literally ripping the water apart with electric current. And you can see it here by this diagram. Now, this here says potential versus current. And so this is basically going from zero to, say, two volts. So if you take two volts with two electrodes and put it in some water, the current will flow, and you'll rip the water apart and produce oxygen and hydrogen at the same time. So that's the first point I want to make. You're, here we're separating it nicely because we've done this little thing. I'm quite embarrassed. I tried to split water with my son the other day, and we made it. It worked, but it, but it wasn't as good as this because you can take the test tube out at the end and set fire to it. And any young boy... When you're giving in chemistry, blah, 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 save the world, blah, 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 fire, yes. <laughs> and this is where we, this is also a picture in a, test, uh, in a beaker of doing standard electrolysis. So we asked ourselves a question a few years ago, because I'm a fundamentalist when it comes to science. I'm not very good with application or, you know, writing a grant application saying I'm going to save the world because I'm going to do this thing. I want to do things that were new. And so I, one of the guys I brought in, and he's in, in the audience here, Mark Symes, I got him from MIT. It always sounds good, Mark, to use your CV to get money. Uh, and, and, and we said, look, you can do anything you want with the chemistry, but we, we mustn't copy what people have been doing catalytically, and I'll explain why in a moment. But let's carry on. Water splitting is a possible solution. We can use renewable energy to produce hydrogen. <coughs> hydrogen can be used as fuel. Hydrogen can be used for food, but... Current electrolysis needs high power, and when hydrogen and oxygen mix, you get that. That's a big problem. But let's have another look at water splitting. Biology takes two steps. And this is where I was saying to Mark, you know what, why don't we try and take two steps? He's like, all right. Went away, and I kept harassing him. And I, got, I figured out that actually he wants to be left alone in the lab, and he'll come back to me when he has something. And so looking at the first step, this is me actually adding some sodium metal to a metal oxide, this yellow thing here, and you'll see it go blue. And that blue color, I'm wearing Google Glass under my lab specs, of course. That blue color is the electrons. Oh, it catches fire in the end because I gave, put too much in there. And we realized that by, and the reason I want to show you that video is it gets into your head that electrons are blue. They are blue when they are in a solution. If you put them in liquid ammonia, they turn blue. In water, they turn blue. That is basically solvated electron, which keeps catching fire. But this shows that my initial idea, that using a metal oxide to take the product of just oxidizing water, oxygen, and the protons and the electrons, is kind of interesting, because we could take two steps. And everyone went, no, that's dumb. Why do you want to do that? You could, you, producing hydrogen and oxygen at the same time is the best way forward. And so in my group, we started to figure out, well, we could use synthetic biology by taking different bacteria and plugging them together. And that's one part of our work. And I've resisted talking about it today because we would be here for a long time. And I really want to focus on these metal oxides. And here is a picture of a metal oxide. There's actually a crystal structure, the molecular structure. In here, these, po these polyhedra refer to um, atoms of tungsten, which are in the center. And these red things here are other oxygen atoms. And there are some... Um, ruthenium atoms in the center here, in this case, or it can be ruthenium or cobalt. Cobalt's a bit better because you can find it more uh, easily. And the idea was that taking this cluster, this molecule, this nanomolecule, and basically shining light on it would allow us to do the water splitting reaction. That's one of the things we wanted to test. But th the problem was that this is what we call a catalyst. And there are lots of charlatans doing catalysis out there, and I was really afraid of doing catalysis. So I said, no, I don't want to do that. 
So what I said instead to Mark is, well, why don't we take this metal oxide nanocluster, and I'll rotate it here. Oh, there we go, it rotates. Well, hey. Now you can see the blue things. These are actually tungsten atoms, and in there, this is phosphorus. But we can change these atoms. So you've got this big, like a bottle, and inside you've got the ship, and you can change the ship. And by changing these elements here, we can change the amount of voltage. It's a bit like changing the way the battery works. So by doing some nanochemistry, we can change the absolute voltage of that. So we can make an easy one, and we can make a hard one. Where do you think we started? We, of course, with the easy one. And the reason we started the easy one is we realized that we can use a process called self-assembly, which is really the chemist going in the lab and looking like they're making um, a cup of tea, basically. They're just putting solutions together, adding salt, and the molecules will just react in a predetermined way, and we form the cluster. And it just so happens when we put the cluster between some electrodes and we put an electric field in, we can get the inside of the cluster to tell us about the outside. So it's like a nano within nano. I was busy writing a grant on nano within nano, and everyone was a bit confused. But then when we realized we can basically add electrons to this and turn it blue, and then we can connect this together to make a material, we can make a sponge. And the bottom line is we have this metal oxide <coughs> sponge that's configured at the nanoscale, and we can turn it blue. Well, hey, what does that mean? Well, it makes a really good movie. This is, like, this is actually like your... This is from the perspective of an individual molecule of benzene that you're going to see just there. So it's a really small molecule, but really there's a lot of space in there, which is important if you want to store a gas, and it's really well defined. So we went to the lab, and Mark you know, kept me out of the lab for ages, and in the end I bust in, bust in and say, look, is anything happening? He said, well, I think so. What happens when I actually add a voltage to these two electrodes, and I've got my, you know, my my metal oxide, it turns blue. But it's a bit sorry, because we just make oxygen and we don't make any hydrogen. So we do all this effort, all this effort, all this energy, and we just make oxygen. I was like, oh, that's... He said, but it's blue. And I was like, yeah, that's cool, it's blue. So the electrons are on the surface of this metal oxide. Then he did what any good chemist would do, is he reversed the electro potential, and hydrogen came out. And we were like, wow, this is fascinating. So we could go left, right, oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Think back to before. We had to release hydrogen and oxygen at the same time. There was no choice. If you wanted to make split water and save the world, you had to make your hydrogen and oxygen at the same time. What is the key problem with that? Bang. And also, you make different volumes. So there's all compression, separation issues. But now, we've come up a way of doing two voltages and coming up with two different gases. But when we tried to tell our peers, it was interesting, they went, ah, oh, it's boring, you have to do it twice. Cronin, you're an idiot. I'm like, okay. And we kind of battled on for a bit. But then we realized that we could change the, the, the effort, the way we did put the effort in. So whereas here, we put power in here. So you put power in once, and then you put power in again to get hydrogen out. We realized by making the, doing the hard thing first rather than the easy thing, something interesting could happen. <laughs> And not only that, and I'll come to what that is, just to build up the tension, because chemistry tension is always good, we could connect together the flow system in a flow system so we could have one side continually making blue stuff. So over here, you're just making oxygen over here. So oxygen is in you know, your living room. And in your kitchen, you're making the hydrogen. I'm just talking about spatial separation. I'm not expecting you to make oxygen in your living room and hydrogen. But they're separated in space. So oxygen's been made here, and hydrogen's been made here. And the blue thing has been flowed on a pipe to another electrode, and out comes the hydrogen. Nowhere near the oxygen. So you're separating it quite some distance. But that was the easy stuff. That was too hard. And everyone said, that's really boring and not really interesting. And we cried a bit, and we went back to the lab. We're still convinced uh, Glasgow might be interesting. Though. Then we did it the harder way. And so what we did now is we charged up and produced oxygen in the first step. And then something remarkable happened when we were trying to do the second step. We realized just by putting in the electrode and adding no power, all the hydrogen came out. And I'll show you, I just kind of gave it away. But... So here we go, now here's our blue liquid, no electrode, over a catalyst, and look, boom, this is hydrogen being evacuated. 
And this is the clock here to show we're not cheating. Yeah, it's real time. I think it's real time. So we're able to produce quite a lot of hydrogen very quickly. So suddenly, people started to get it. Step one, evolve oxygen needs power. Step two, store blue electrons as liquid. Step three, add blue electrons to catalyst, no power needed. This is a hydrogen hydroelectric dam. Think about how hydroelectric dam works. When you've got power, you pump all the water up the hill when you, you know, your nuclear reactor is going spare and you need to do something with all that energy. Then, when you need that power, you just open the gate and gravity ret is, returns your water to its potential minima and you get all the energy back out again. This is an electrochemical hydroelectric dam. And you get spontaneous hydrogen evolution. So we, we observed this in the lab, and as any good scientist, we published it, and luckily the derivative paper got published in Science, whereas the Science and Nature rejected the first paper. Uh, but the derivative one, the more boring one, they went, and it was, and everyone got it. Because we understood what the consequences were. We were kind of, we're not bored, it was just like, yeah, we told you so. But of course, it was really nice to get it this way. That was easy. Now, if it lives up to the promise, how on earth can we turn this into a new concept for splitting water? And if you think about it, this is, this is one of the things we were trying to say the first time around. For ever, in chemistry, water is split in one step. Biology does it in two, but no one's ever done that before. We've done it in two. Look at us, aren't we great? And they just went, no. Now they went, okay, now this is interesting. But we now have to get from here, from this lab-based system, to making a real electrolyzer. And here's an example. This is what uh, Greg Chisholm built. And this is our liquid gold, if you like, our blue electron stuff uh, being produced continuously. And he's now opening the valve and to produce hydrogen. And he's had this rig running for hours and hours and hours now. And it works at an energy density that is almost half. I know this, sounds, this might sound a bit not what you can do in, in the real world. So in a couple of years, going from something in the lab that did nothing to making almost half what you can get is just amazing. And I take my hat off to Greg and to Mark, who've been working on this um, together with other team members who I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, and here's the electrolyzer down here. And we've got these pumps to push around this blue stuff. So here we went from science discovery to technology test rig, and I'm very proud of that personally because a lot of people would give up when everyone said it's nonsense. But I think for me to express to people why the science was interesting, we had to actually go and apply it. And the application is obvious then, but isn't it nice that we made that effort and, and the, the science holds up, and that's, uh, if that makes sense. So this is the bottom line because now we're applying it and obviously you want to do something with it. We've got this wonderful discovery made in a lab, thanks to Glasgow University and Solar Fuels, thanks to the team. Now we want to kind of apply it, and, and the team did it very well, and we, we wrote a proposal to, to spin this out. And what did we say? Well, our system is the fastest. The nice thing is, we are now faster than any commercial electrolyzer. If you want to produce hydrogen in a renewable way, this is the fastest way bar none. So there's a nice Mercedes. It's the purest, because you actually produce hydrogen separate to oxygen. So there's no fear that's going to explode. It's cheaper. Well, it will be <laughs> when I stop getting involved. It's more efficient, and it's modular. And so these are the key points that we're trying to get together and try and explain to people why this should be, become a new technology and one of the reasons why I'm here. But I think the journey is kind of important in that respect. So the, the big issue that we have in going from far, proving that we have the fastest and the purest and the cheapest is that we have a very simple ideal conditions rig. And the next step is to try and start to make a big version and do it outside, do it in other people's labs, make hydrogen in other places and get it to work 24 seven. And this is Astria up here, just for Mark. So our discovery is so great that we are starting a company called Astria Power. This is not the logo yet, because uh, I think I'll get told off if I spelt it correctly. 
No, is it spelled correctly or well? It's the goddess of purity. <laughs> and it's going to make hydrogen power and fuel cheap and accessible on demand. I've got the two colors though, Mark. Which is, and so this is the next step for the, the innovation and how we're going to take this out from, from the lab to a company. And at the moment, what we're doing is we're busy raising money to do that, and it will happen this year. The one thing that we have to do with the system, though, is this is just a stepping stone to a bigger energy solution. And the thing that really excites me about this is we have, is the integration. Because in Scotland you don't have, talking about solar fuel is a bit of a nonsense because we don't ever see the, the sun. So we have to figure out how we can replace um, the lack of sun with some other renewable input. Now wind is perfect. We have this other problem in Scotland is we've got all this <laughs> offshore wind. But how on earth do we get that energy ashore? Um, building uh, um, high um, power lines to these um, um, wind turbines is really hard. But what we do have offshore is a pipeline, a pipeline infrastructure. So one idea is that we could imagine a scenario where we have installations of wind turbines that are producing gas, hydrogen gas, and that taps into the existing offshore pipelines. And that is used to get the, guy, the, the, the gas back. And that actually appears to be feasible according to gas injection into the, the natural gas uh, grid, which is done in Germany right now. The Germans always seem to be ahead, but <coughs> the Scottish are behind them. So we take the hydrogen that we produce, um, we take the, sorry, the electricity that's made, and we put it into electrolyzer, and we make hydrogen. And that hydrogen is then stored either in our liquid or, or in another vessel. And what we're actually posing as a problem is whether our system is an energy storage system or just a vector, a way of moving energy around. And that doesn't really matter right now. It depends on your application. It depends on how big a tank you have and how much money you want to invest in the system. So that's important. There's nothing for free. And then what we're going to do is then produce this hydrogen that you can then put in a fuel cell so you can get your electricity back out, to put into grid electricity, or you can burn it. Of course, there's going to be another arrow here in the end where we want to use that to do something more interesting. And the other thing that perhaps I, I should make clear is with this system, you can in fact trickle charge it trickle if you, over the day and so that you can basically let evolve oxygen during the day and make no hydrogen. And if you have just the, the right amount of uh, liquid, you can charge it up and probably about seven hours of sunlight in Arizona, I think this is in Arizona, with a cell voltage of two volts, would give you enough hydrogen to fill up a car. And so we would need 250 liters or something, and an electrode area of 100 meters squared. But actually, that's not that not, not big a problem, because it's, if it's a carbon electrode, you can access that relatively easily. So this is one thing we want to play with in the future, is to make a solar-powered version that could be deployed out um, in, in, in countries where there is enough sunlight. But also just to prove the principle that we can charge the car on demand. That we do all the hard work during the day, you're not scared that your hydrogen cellar is going to blow up, and then when you need it, you just load the car up. What does a future roadmap looking like, look like? Well, right now, we're using these metal oxides, we're calling them ECPBs, um, in electrolyzers and couple them to uh, hydrogen generation. We are going to go through it to the overall goal, which is the fixation of carbon. Right now, we can split water in a new way. That's the first point I want to make really here. We can make oxygen and hydrogen separately in space and time and decouple them. So now we can have modules for different applications. Think about if you need high purity hydrogen, not for burning, but maybe for some kind of electrochemical or manufacturing process where you need really pure hydrogen. There's quite a number of them. So that works quite nicely. The next key development will be these metal oxides for carbon dioxide sequestration. The wonderful thing about these molybdenum blues and these tungsten blues, these liquid blue electrons, is that this is the stuff you need to reduce CO2. And we're fighting against the energy penalty that is hard to um, reduce CO2. And in fact, 
CO2 is such a hard molecule to, um, uh, to activate, it's worth pondering that around about, if you were to take all the biomass on planet Earth and weigh it, between 30 and 40% of that biomass by weight is dedicated to one molecule called Rubisco. And this molecule is the molecule that activates CO2. And it does it at the speed of about one CO2 molecule per second. So when you next turn on your engine, and you think about how many molecules, if you can count them, of diesel, petrol, or how many molecules of CO2, that's probably better, that you're making, just think for a second that this molecule CO2 took one second, and then you remember, you can drive for a year, but you need to stop for, for, for three million. So I'm coming to the end of the talk now, and I just want to give a few perspectives. I was um, trying to say I, I resisted the urge to go into too deep science, not because I, I, I want to dumb it down, but I wanted to make the real... Um, um, I wanted to provoke you into thinking about what would happen if... What would happen if we stopped using fossil fuels? tomorrow, or we, we committed ourselves to really phasing them out, not pretending. I think Germany right now is actually committed to doing it. It's quite interesting. And also, from my point of view, scientifically, why did I get into this? And from a science point of view, I like big challenges and big problems. It's a bit like, you know, saying, right, we're going to send astronauts to the moon. It was doable, but how do we get there? What is the propulsion system we need? What is the vision? What do you want? And I'm trying to train and inspire young people to come to me and work for me, and telling them you might save the world is quite good. <laughs> of course, I really would like to be allowed the freedom that this chap had to just basically dream, up, dream about physics in a way, you know, where he didn't have Facebook distracting him or Twitter or email or impact statements. I can go on. But... Probably life wasn't that, that easy for him either, for various reasons. But also, the point I want to make, and maybe I won't say it, but I'll just show you the, the part of the slide, is that science is, in fact, this. You need to give people the, the chance to do this a lot. And when you spot something interesting, to run with it. And one of the things that have really been a great privilege to work with the people that I've had in the group, particularly in the energy team, is that they were very good at this. Not literally, but in the lab. And when we spotted that something unusual was happening and everyone said, you're silly, we went, yeah, 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 but Lee, he's always silly. Don't worry about that. And we carried on. And in the end, people start to say, you know what, you're a little bit less silly than you were last week. And, you just, and, and that's kind of how science works, I think. And for me, this has been a really interesting journey into just, if it's ridiculous but scientifically credible, do it. Again, if it's ridiculous but scientifically credible, do it. Because there are a lot of scientists out there that really, they're afraid of this now. Because we have to, we have to be held to account in a way that we didn't need to be. I'd love to write an impact statement for, you know, for him now. So, as you know, Einstein came up with the theory of relativity. How much is their relativity worth every year? It's worth about $100 billion. Who got here using GPS? Who receives um, shipments from overseas on a boat using GPS? I mean, GPS is kind of the obvious. Yes, they would have worked it out when they shoved a clock into space and they noticed there was frame dragging going on. But you know what? His impact statement took, you know, 100 years. <laughs> so this is one of the kind of comments I'd like to make. Would we be allowed to do that now? I don't know. One of the things I still feel privileged to be able to do in the system is we have managed to do what we've done. We haven't been retarded by it. On, on the contrary, we've been helped a lot. So the last bit, the thing that I really wanted to leave you with is what are the tough questions we have to ask as a result of this? I'm a scientist and I know what I don't know. And that's my job, is to know what I don't know and everything else I don't know. Um, not to tell you how I'm going to save the world. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very grateful for more of your taxpayer money to gamble, oh, damn it, I said it, um, <laughs> in my lab and then it be incumbent upon me when I spot something interesting to make sure it gets out of the lab. I think that's what people demand. Not that I'm going to tell you I'm going to cure cancer and Alzheimer's and anything else we can tell the various people running for election right now that we're going to do. But what are the tough questions we'll be asking them? 
Can we really stop using fossil fuels fast enough? Can we? Are they really committed to it, or are they really in, embedded in their five-year election cycle? What lifestyle challenges are you, changes are you willing to make? Think about it. If, if life is going to end on planet Earth in about 100 years, if we carry on like this, <coughs> then what would we do to prevent that? Or is this just drama? Because it's getting towards the end of the lecture. I don't know. But it's something that we should ask ourselves. What changes could we make in food, transport, and urban systems that would make that easier for us to, to, to do without the catastrophe that may await? It may not happen. I just don't know. And the gamble in science is one thing, but the gamble with an environment is another. And what do you want to tell your children? We have this debate all the time. What do you want to tell them? Sorry, I burnt your fossil fuel allowance. Sorry about that. Just walk. <coughs> I don't know. I think this is a debate that I, you know, I can start. I don't know the answer. But I, 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 I didn't really think too much about it until the last week or two. And it, it is a, quite a serious and terrifying series of questions. But this is where we can cheer up, because this is what we want to do. And the BBC made this for me when I went on Newsnight to talk about the fact that, yeah, we're burning fossil fuel, making CO2, but wouldn't it be awesome if we could use wind energy and solar energy to take that CO2 and fix it back in carbon and make this closed carbon cycle? And I think this probably is the intermediate solution to the problem. And we just need to find a way to get there. Because I'm fed up with feeling guilty about getting in my car or going on a plane or turning on my lawnmower and, or eating some meat. I feel quite guilty. So we need to figure out if this is doable. And we need to perhaps um, be more brave about the, the, the decisions we're making scientifically. And that's starting. And it's starting in Scotland and the UK, and I'm quite proud of that. So at this point, I'm going to stop, and I'm almost dead on schedule. And I want to just stop by uh, um, finish by um, acknowledging a number of people. First of all, um, Richard Coulter, who couldn't be here tonight, who's uh, uh, the Hooker Professor in Botany, who is a, really loves photosynthesis, and he's a bit of a scientific hippie. And he took me aside one day and said, I want to show you my, uh, you know, my light harvesting molecule, and isn't it wonderful? And it was, actually. But, and he just really was a very good mentor, and he still is, uh, when I can locate him. And also Mark Symes, there he is. He has since left my group, um, who started this project. And Greg Chisholm, who's then taken on the project um, into uh, the spin-out, well, toward the spin-out phase. And Leanne, who's also been working in, in the proof of concept project. Ben, who worked on the highly hard, spontaneous hydrogen producing material. And then I've got some PhD students, Lewis and Neil, who have been working in the energy squad at the moment, as we call them, and Pedro, who was there trying lots of different combinations of metal oxides. And these guys, of course, are the green saints. They are trying their best to make a difference, and we'll give Mark one as well. And I also think it's worth saying that, although I'm acknowledging um, EPSRC, the BBSRC, Scottish Enterprise, and we, we, Scottish Enterprise have been brilliant, as has West Cam, the Royal Society, I really would like to thank the University of Glasgow, and in particular Steve Beaumont is here, who really I convinced us, well, we convinced each other that solar fuels was a good idea. At the time I was like, yeah, I just want more money for gambling. And he just said, don't bloody well, just don't tell him that. And then when he had the confidence in us to do this, um, and it started to work out, it was really exciting, because I was like ringing him up and saying, look, it's actually working. Good bet. And so we carried on, and I think... You know, Steve, uh, and then with John Chapman, and then now with Muffy, who's the head of college, have been really supportive. And the University of Glasgow, you know, has, has a tough job nowadays. It's a really old institution. It's also a civic university to play this, be at the right stage, enlighten and op open access and be in this world of um, FOI and impact and money and political whatever, whatnot. So it's, it's, I'm really grateful to them. And also, 
I never thought I'd have thanked these guys, and you better not tell them, Mark or Steve. And this is the IP group. And the IP group are a corporate investor that have partnered with the University of Glasgow to find little nuggets of gold or things that they think are not fool's gold, but they're not sure. And the IP group actually worked with us and helped us work out which questions we could ask in a, in a you know, science is all great. I could sit here tonight and tell you about all my greatest scientific discoveries that would have no application to anything. But what could make an impact via our current commercialization process? And they really helped us do that. And that was really great. I think I'm going to stop there and thank my wife for coming, my father, his partner, my neighbors <laughs> who've come because I've, I've bothered them over, over, over the years. And, and also, finally, to thank you and my research group that have come. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. So we come to question time. If you raise your hand, then we'll try to get around. Could we open the door? Is there anybody in the overflow room? Because I have to say to them, if you want to ask a question... <coughs> Thanks, yeah. Well, maybe they'll appear in a minute. There's a question at the back. mine the appropriate uh, rubidium tungsten platinum for your your cells <laughs> i right um i don't know if we have enough energy to uh, to scale um current electrolyzer technology um i haven't done that calculation and the calculations are always a moving target some of the things that we're working on we want to go to the dream is to basically make a cell that's all carbon and have a minimum precious metal on it, maybe nickel, yeah. maybe cobalt, or even iron. If we could do it with iron, then the answer to your question is most certainly yes. One of the things I didn't touch on, and I think your question is really insightful, because it asks a question about scale. And scale, a global scale solution, is going to take a long time. And that's why we need to have these hard discussions now. What's interesting as well, though, is not just about um, the energy required, I think we do, we should look at humanity as in this really interesting state in technology after the kind of stone age, the bronze age, and using coal, and now with fossil fuel, is we now need to make a leap to the next energy that's going to run out and understand we're on this continual development process. So I just hope the French can get their uh, fusion reactor yeah, working in absolutely. time. Because <laughs> that, may, that may help. Absolutely. So, but there's some serious people. To finally answer it, there is an asteroid out there that's got quite a lot of platinum yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah. Used to and they're, and they're thinking about nudging it here, and it'll take 100 years. Yeah. That's actually not a bad idea. Yeah, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Here, got a microphone. If you hold the microphone directly in front of your face, they're rather directional. Yes. Good. Um, I'm an engineer, so I find all this very interesting. Um, you've got to the proof of concept, okay? How big would the plant have to be to produce 100 megawatts? Oh, I will ask Greg. So, that, that, so the way that electrolyzers work is that you have num stacks of them. Okay, so you, can have a, uh, so you can have a set of plates. It's about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, which gives, what does a normal PM give, Greg? You willing to be on the spot? Well, a one megawatt, no, so about 250 kilowatt stack is about the size of the length of it. Yeah, so you can do the math from there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peter. Yeah. That was very thought-provoking, uh, Lee, great. Um, the question, this, this sounds a, question, a, a bit of focusing on detail, but if you are out there and, and you've got these offshore plants that are producing the hydrogen which comes in in the pipeline, what happens to the oxygen? You, you do it, in so if you do it in two steps, you just vent the oxygen. Yeah, I mean, if you want them, you can have the oxygen if you want it, but you vent the oxygen, because you do it in step one. So the oxygen is gone. Yep. And then you can go through a gas injection process. I'm, I'm making this up, right? I don't know. No, 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 but, no, then I, but the process, the nice thing is, using this process, if you are 
doing two-step electrolysis, you never inject oxygen into the gas line by mistake. No, no, I understand. Okay, that, that, that's great. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very speculative too. But yes. ultimately, <laughs> if all of this, if, if, you're, if this becomes the principal source of fuel, aren't you going to put an enormous amount of extra oxygen into the atmosphere? No, 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 no. Okay, would be nice actually. We, we, then it would be, we wouldn't have to have such, you know, uh, many red blood cells or whatever it is we need. Um, right. So the first point, yeah, maybe coming back to this, these two questions are related. So the first point I want to make: the innovation we described here is not going to save the world. I, I think I said not saving the world ten times. What we're posing to do here is solve a very specific problem, which is to make non-fossil fuel hydrogen available. Because right now, to feed the world. You're burning fossil fuel. So that's the first point. Right now, high, um, electrolyzed hydrogen is a very, in, well, sorry, electrolysis is a, seen to be as an intermediate solution to take wind energy and store it. Storage of renewables is a problem. We aren't going to replace everything, but if we can replace, if we can make marginal wind, if you like, accessible, because we've got this lower power solution, and we don't have to be running at such high power densities. Right now, the current electrolyzers have to run at high power density. So if the, wi the wind has to be going like the clappers, or you don't turn on your electrolyzer, or you have a big battery. So this removes the big battery need. So I mean, I didn't, from, that, from a detailed point of view, the framing was bad. This is not gonna save the world, but it's gonna produce a new technology that will allow us to maybe store wind energy or some other renewable energies, which is a big problem in Scotland. Because we're talking about renewables, we have no storage. So I think that's where we're going with this. So that the immediate commercial application is to take normal PEM electrolyzers and replace them with this technology. And also to come up with those areas where people want high purity hydrogen, of which there's quite a large demand, and that we're probably <coughs> going to go into that type of avenue. I just add to that, I mean, the point about oxygen, you actually don't want to push the oxygen level up too far. Things become very flammable rather quickly, and a small spark when you take your blouse or shirt off can result so, in a disaster. So, so we've done the calculation to, I mean, right now, fortunately or unfortunately, we are burning things at such a rate. I think the amount of production of CO2, I want to know how much oxygen, the oxygen levels are actually going down because our CO2 levels are going up. We are not fixing all that CO2 and producing oxygen. So I don't think that's gonna be, if we get to a point where we are doing that, then I'll be quite ex excited because the technology really works. But yeah, it, we, we, the, the, the real answer is that we need a very big um, scale um, investigation done. But right now we're talking about replacing a niche application and making sure that fossil hydrogen is not used in the longer term. Another question. Um, about the risks involved by uh, using metal oxides on some scale, uh, do we know how toxic are them and do we know how biodegradable are them? Of the, of the oxides? Yes. I mean, so, okay, so heavy metal oxides or heavy metals in general are quite toxic, but I mean, toxic is, is relative. So, um, I would not want to be chucking uh, sodium molybdate and tungstates into the groundwater in, on, in huge volumes. However, you're not going to die of heavy metal poisoning with, with them. I think the problem is more likely how do, we, how do we take care of them so we can deploy these things at scale. So in terms of toxicity, it's not like um, chromium or cadmium. But it's not something, I would, just because it's not as toxic as cadmium doesn't mean I would put it into the river. You'd need, but the nice thing is, it's very easy to handle. It's aqueous, it's soluble in water. Um, you can iron exchange it out. It, it's, not, it's not corrosive to the degree that it's going to cause things to fail. So it's probably just as easy to deal with as any other um, um, technology that has um, um, heavy metals in it, if that makes sense. OK, it's so a question here first, and there's one later at the back. But this one first, please. I won't use the word commercialize, but in taking this into actuality 24-7, um, have you worries that people will have enough imagination uh, and the right scale to put their money where your mouth is? <laughs> <laughs> I never have that problem. No. Um, 
So it's really, we're in a really interesting time because actually, um, no, we, I think we'll have investment pretty quickly. And the reasons are quite clear. And this is why I really did mean the thanks to the investors we've got on board because they're really almost like founders in that we are faster. What I didn't talk about a lot because it's math is we reduce the amount of platinum we need in the cell by 30 times. So if you buy our electrolyzer, it's got 30 times less platinum in it, but it's as fast. Or it's got the same amount of platinum in it, it's 30 times faster. Because you also remove the, the need for separating hydrogen and oxygen, it can run at a much lower energy density. So if the wind is just doing this, rather than blowing a gale, I can extract it. If then, um, without exploding, because <laughs> that's the problem is you get mixing at low power. power. Um, <coughs> so there's a whole bunch of things that make this technology competitive with the incumbents. So that's why um, and we, and we're looking at two models where we can actually add our technology onto existing, so we're not competing, we're upgrading. So if we could take every electrolyzer in the world and upgrade it to use this, we reduce the cost, we increase the reliability, and we increase the flexibility. And that, unfortunately, well, no, not for, fortunately, is what sells, not how groovy the science is or whether we're going to save the world. That doesn't care. We don't care about that from an investor point of view. They care about how, if it's going to save money. And the answer is yes. Right. Question there. Thank you. A very interesting talk about the challenge of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and alternative to fossil fuel. My question is related to if your idea of hydrogen uh, fuel as an alternative was to take off, have you or will you be doing a uh, relative check on safety of, say, hydrogen fuel based uh, as compared to, let's say, nuclear? Oh, that's a good, good point. Um, so I think at the moment we are, I'm not sure whether hydrogen fuel is, is, is the thing to use. I think that producing cheaper hydrogen to kickstart renewables in a more serious sense, to access the renewables that Scotland has available is a very good point. That's one of the reasons why the university was quite, I convinced them to do this, because we want to exploit natural resource that we have available in Scotland. That's the first point. The second point is I think in the end we need to activate CO2. I don't want to have hydrogen in my car. I don't. I want, I want diesel or petrol, and I want petrol without the fossil. But that is so far away right now, you'll see any Tom, Tick and Harry who's probably trying to steal your money for investment who has not the answer. The only, so we have to do this in steps. So the first step is making hydrogen cheaper. And there will need to be a risk assessment. Now, with regards to nuclear, you're, it's kind of a question of scale. It's a bit like, you know, nuclear reactors tend to be safe because of, there's only a few of them and they're looked after carefully, right, in general. Whereas you like, if it's a bit aer like airplanes versus traveling on a bicycle or in a car. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite difficult to compare. There haven't been that many hydrogen explosions that I know of, apart from inve crazy inventors. Uh, and obviously, we can talk about the Hindenburg. But I think hy <laughs> but hydrogen is a lot safer than you think. And if you keep the oxygen away, it's even safer. And I think keeping it safe and well organized in the technology, which when the technology fails, and the one nice thing about this technology is it scales, it will fail to safety, whereas a lot won't explode, whereas a lot of conventional electrolyzers could fail and explode. That's at least my feeling. I'm, you know, I take that with a pinch of salt because I haven't blew one up yet. Okay. Right, question here. Um, do you think your cells could be used in cars to produce like, um, hydrogen on demand as opposed to, say, filling up your car with hydrogen has been considered at the moment? Yeah, sorry, get that, that's a good question. It got me thinking. I mean, there is actually um, a, you could do that, but it's probably not going to work in this case because of the volumes. But there is an application, a niche application, where some commercial vehicles <laughs> like to inject hydrogen into their carbon engine to increase the cleanness of the burn. One possible application of putting electrolyzer into a car would be to use the car's fossil fuel power, seems a bit crazy, to split water to produce hydrogen, to add the hydrogen back into the engine to make the burn cleaner because it changes the efficiency of the engine. But when, this is one of the wonderful things about publishing in this area, is you get some crackpots come to you, and we had a few people come to us to describe this, and we're not sure whether it's genius or 
but, but I, think, I think my colleagues who are sitting at the back there are smiling and keeping their heads down at the moment. But yeah, so there are, there are ideas that aren't perpetual motion machines. You want, if you can do something to clean up the burn in your fossil fuel car with some hydrogen, that would be good. But I don't think we're going to use a system to, replay, to, to, to fill up the car instantly right now. It depends how good the technology gets. I don't know yet. I guess that's probably the much quicker answer to your question. <laughs> Perhaps one final question. If... No, then in that case, I'll ask Professor Bowman to give the vote of thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much, Bob. Well, um, Lee's already given me a bit of an introduction, but I'm the awards convener here at the Royal Society. Um, and in, in a previous existence, um, which fortunately has now stopped, I was Vice Principal for Research and Enterprise at the University of Glasgow, in which capacity Lee used to lecture me a lot, <laughs> uh, largely about things that he's already touched on. Where's the money? Where's the space? stop asking me for impact statements and so on and so forth. So I'm very, very used to being lectured at by Lee, but I think this is the first time I've actually been to a lecture by Lee, um, and uh, what a pleasure it's been to, to listen to him this evening. I, I'd like to start by thanking you all for coming. There's been, as, as was pointed out earlier, a pretty capacity audience here, and uh, it's, it's delightful to see so many people coming along to this, this prize lecture. Um, and and I, I really hope you enjoyed uh, uh, what you heard uh, this evening and have found some inspiration from it. I think Lee really has given us a provocative and inspiring lecture this evening. Um, and I think he's, I, I don't want to summarize what he has said in, in any detail, but I think he's made some pretty key points about the nature of science and why it's really important to, to Scotland, to the UK, to, to the world's economy. First of all, he's, he's, he's trying to tackle a really important challenge for, uh, for humanity, um, uh, for the natural environment, for, for, for the world. Uh, and he spent some time talking to us and explaining to us why it's really important to tackle this challenge, why as scientists we have a responsibility to tackle this challenge, um, and, uh, and, and uh, how it is that, um, we, why it is we, we need to, to tackle the challenge in the way that he has, he and his colleagues have tackled it, namely not just let's find another energy source, but why it's important that we find ways of making fuel, things that we can turn into, into fertilizer, turn into fuel for our cars, portable materials that we can hike around rather than having to connect things up to electricity. So that's the challenge that he talked about. Um, the second important thing it seems to me that he's talked to us about is how by asking some fundamental questions um, such as uh, uh, how do we make fuel directly from sunlight? Um, how do we cut out plants? We, we know about the use of renewable fuels in, in, the, in the biofuel, in burning wood and burning, in, burning crops and so on and so forth. All of that requires of plants as an intermediate, and it's a very inefficient way of going about things, as he has illustrated uh, uh, so, so eloquently this, this evening. How do we cut that step out? How do we go directly from sunlight or energy sources that are produced from sunlight, namely wind or, or wave power? How do, how, do we, how do we couple that and take it directly in, into, in, in, into, in, into fuel without plants? And how can we use our knowledge of the fundamental chemistry of photosynthesis or be inspired by that process to create these new methods of generating useful fuels <coughs> without having to occupy huge amounts of land by, 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 growing, by growing plants? So that's the second thing he's, he's, he's told us about. What well, we've heard about... Uh, in the la that last part of his talk is how scientific research, very fundamental scientific research, asking those questions and trying to come up with some answers to them can lead to significant innovation. Perhaps this evening you have heard about the start of a new industry, an industry which 
could be extremely valuable for Scotland because we have, as Lee has told us, renewable energy in, in droves. We're a very uh, vi viable and valuable source of renewable energy in wind power form. Here is a technology that could potentially help us to store that energy and to use it in the useful ways uh, that he has told us about. That would be a fantastic opportunity for, for Scotland, uh, for Scottish innovation, but importantly, a demonstration of how Scottish basic research can be translated into economic wealth, into prosperity, but more importantly, given the challenge that we are faced with, uh, a way of helping to save the planet. So I think that's a fantastic outcome. And in general terms, some of you who may have read the Financial Times on Saturday and looked at the magazine would have seen an article which, uh, which was about how, what the economists would do uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, 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 if they were politicians. And one of the things that they came up with, with was invest more in scientific research. Why? Because the modeling that they had done showed that the rate of return on scientific investment in research, sorry, investment in scientific research was a 20% rate of return, annual rate of return. That's, of course, not all science is successful, not all science leads to the sort of uh, results and outcomes that Lee is hoping to produce from his research, um, but it's a real demonstration of the power of science, asking fundamental questions and leading to benefit to humanity. So, Lee, thank you very much indeed for your talk. Uh, it has been an inspiring, provocative. I think he almost caused, uh, caused uh, called some of the audience, some of the questioners, crackpots. But maybe we shouldn't go there. Uh, 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 but nevertheless, a provocative talk, an inspiring talk, and maybe you've heard about a new industry here in this lecture theatre for the first time. Thank you very much, Lee. Let's thank Lee in the usual way.